Hi YouTube, how you doing? Thanks for stopping by. This is Matthew with the Counselors Guild. Today we'll be doing a book review on Brief Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Suicide Prevention. It's written by Craig J. Bryan and M. David Rudd. So let's start with the authors. It's first up Craig J. Bryan, a PsyD, board appointed psychologist. Uh, I'm not sure what ABPP exactly stands for, but I know it's a board and they appoint psychologists. Um, but anyway, uh, Executive Director of the National Center for Veteran Studies and Associate Professor in the Department of Psychology and the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Utah. He's an Associate Editor of the, of the journal Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior and previously served on the Board of Directors of the American Association of Suicidology. Next up, M. David Rudd, Ph.D., same uh, board appointment, psychologist, president of the United, uh, University of Memphis, where he's a professor of psychology. He's a co-founder and scientific director of the National Centers for Veteran Studies at the University of Utah. He's published over 200 scientific articles and numerous books on the clinical care of suicidal individuals and is considered an international leader in suicide prevention. So both authors know their stuff, they've been in the game for a while, very trustworthy material we're looking at here. Okay, some book characteristics uh, to start off. This is a clinician's workbook. This is not for the um, layman, it's not a self-help. This is for therapists, psychologists, this is for the professionals. So it's a clinician's workbook. There are five parts to this book. There's 20 chapters, 240 pages, and two appendices. So, BCBT for suicide prevention. This is uh, a, a, a rough outline of what this is. Um, this is from the book. This is written by uh, Brian and Rudd. And it says here, BCBT is highly structured, phased approach that orders interventions that correspond to clinical priorities and the natural process of suicide risk over time. Very highly structured. They have the, um, the client, I think validity is what it's called. The more structured, the, more, the closer you are to the structure of the book, the, um, the better off you are, the, the more likely they're going to get help. Okay, So they want it to be pretty close, very highly structured. It begins with a detailed narrative assessment of the patient's suicidal crisis. Uh, that's the, you know, the crisis that got them to the hospital or their most recent crisis they had. The detailed narrative looks at the closest, newest um, crisis. The initial assessment provides an understanding of the unique factors and circumstances surrounding the patient's clinical needs, thereby setting the stage for the remainder of the treatment. The first phase of treatment, which is typically four sessions in duration, is focused on deactivation of the suicidal mode. We'll talk about the suicidal mode in a second. And symptom stabilization via emotional regulation skills training. Once the suicidal mode has been resolved and the patient has returned to his or her baseline risk level, we'll talk about that later too, BCBT transitions to the second phase of treatment. The second phase, five sessions, the focus is on the suicidal belief systems that underline long-term vulnerability to suicidal crisis. And this doesn't make sense, we're going to get to all this later, okay? The middle section of BCBT is therefore aimed at modifying baseline cognitive risk factors for suicide. In the third and final phase, which typically lasts two sessions, the focus shift to skills integration and rehearsal. Okay, That is the structure, the process of BCBT. It's a phased approach, highly structured, and it, it um, focuses on the it focuses on it first, it focuses on the crisis, what they brought them in, and then later on, it focuses on their baseline. You know, what's causing them to get into that suicidal mode going into crisis. Okay, okay so we'll talk about the suicidal mode and fluid vulnerability model. Okay, the vulnerability model is the foundation of what this whole book is kind of built on, and all the interventions and reasons for being is built on the fluid vulnerability model, okay? But first up, we'll talk about the suicidal mode. All right, this is the suicidal mode. I had to take a picture out of the book. I could not find this anywhere online. But as you can see, there's an acute and there's a baseline. 
okay? And there's activating events. So we'll talk more about this, uh, but as you can see what I just read, the, uh, the first part, um, the first phase, uh, you're gonna look at the acute stuff, get them out of that crisis and back to their baseline and then you're gonna work on that baseline stuff. Okay, but this is the suicidal mode. And they're, all their interventions in the book are set up for the first phase, which is acute. That's, that's, it attacks the acute symptoms. And the, the second phase attacks the baseline symptoms with different interventions that they, they provide in the book. So baseline. This is from the book. This is all written by, um, by Brian and Red. Baseline refers to the individual's predisposition to suicide which include historical and trait-like factors that remain relatively constant over time or tend to resist change over time. So if we go back, the, um, yeah, the baseline, I wanna make sure I get that right. Baseline, if you can look at the boxes down there, if you can see them, cognitive, emotional, physical, and behavioral. You know, if you look at the behavioral, prior attempts, emotion regulation, interpersonal skills, okay? All these different behaviors have a baseline that makes them more at risk for suicide, okay? I believe, I don't know if it says in the, in the slide, but I know it says in the book, the more um, of these that you have, like if you have behavioral, cognitive, emotional, and physical, the more at risk for suicide. But if you just have cognitive, it kind of lowers your, your, your threshold. Uh, we'll get into that later, okay? Uh, so baselines is the second point. When faced with stressful life events, individuals with higher baseline risk are more likely to become suicidal and to make a suicide attempt than individuals with lower baseline risk. A client with many baseline risk factors have lower thresholds of tolerance. So this is just what I was just talking about. Causing them to experience frequent suicidal episodes and very slight activating events. Okay, so if you have a lot in the baseline, if you have a lot in cognitive, behavioral, physical, emotional, it doesn't take much to get you into that acute, okay? The activating event could be something very small, okay? It doesn't have to necessarily be like a death of a pet. You know, it could be just uh, somebody didn't say hi when I waved at them or something like that, okay? That's, well, that's kind of exaggerating, but, you know, uh, that's, that's kind of what they're talking about. And let's see here. And the, the fourth point here, I gave you an example. I'm just looking at the cognitive domain. They go through each one of those domains um, in the book. But the cognitive domain, borderline risk factors include internalized, implicit self-perceptions, including shame, self-hatred, perceived effectiveness, deficits in cognitive flexibility and impaired executive functioning, and the ability to quickly generate potential solutions to problems problem-solving deficits. The authors do give examples of each one. Okay, I put that down. Um, so that's just a cognitive. Those are just some baseline cognitive examples that might affect somebody um, going into that acute uh, phase. Okay. All right, so let's look at the acute, okay, at the top here. This is, this, this is where they're coming at the hospital. This is when they're, you know, very suicidal. They're more likely to commit suicide in the acute than at their best baseline, okay? This is a short-term fluctuations, and this is all written by the authors. Um, this is all in their book here, okay? Uh, and they give that, I mean, they do a lot better job at, at the details, uh, giving you really a lot of information about each one of these phases. Um, and the book is very well, I mean, it, it is, it, it gives you so much. Um, really helps uh, understand um, the theory and, and suicide mode. Like it really, really easy, uh, easy to read, I should say. So short-term fluctuations in suicidal risks that occur in response to external events such as life stressors or triggering experiences. Acute risk is also associated with the consequent behaviors of the individual takes in reaction to stress response like substance use, social withdrawal. These behaviors are often aimed at reducing or escaping from emotional distress. These various domains are interactive in nature, such that activation in one domain is often associated with activation in another domain. Example, so within the cognitive domain, 
Acute risk factors include automatic thoughts and assumptions that occur in response to stressful situations, such as hopelessness, feeling trapped, perceived burdenness, and self-depreciation. Okay. So that's the acute. Uh, so we're, we're, at, we're, at, we're usually at baseline. Well, not usually. Well, we're at baseline, and then something that in the environment happens, that's the activating event. We don't have any control over that. We just have um, uh, control over the acute and baseline, and you got to you know, use your interventions to, to work on those. All right, next up, so that was the suicidal mode, acute baseline. And now we're gonna get into the fluid vulnerability theory of suicide. Okay, this is what the whole book is, is found on, okay. Um, I've never heard of this theory before, so I was really um, interested in learning about it. And it's, I mean, there's a huge part in the chapter on this theory. Uh, I'm just kind of giving you the, uh, um, the what the like the brief synopsis or whatever what the author gives gives in the book so this is all from the authors here the core assumptions of the fluid vulnerability theory the first one is suicide risk comprises stable and dynamic properties referred to as baseline risk and acute risk baseline risk entails a chronic and more persistent aspect of risk whereas acute risk entails a state-based and more transient aspect of risk Suicide episodes are time limited. Baseline risk varies from individual to individual based on one's unique constellation of historical and development predispositions. So it's, it's structured, yes. You know, um, everybody goes through the phases um, typically the same, but it's not a cookie cutter, okay? You're, um, you know, this, this chart here um, or this uh, example figure what you want to call it, it's going to be different for everybody. You know, um, they may have emotional, but no physical, you know, so it's, it's, it's going to be different for everybody. And you, and you kind of, uh, uh, when you do your interventions, you'll, you'll focus more on, on what um, that person has. So let's see, let's see. Number four, acute suicidal episodes occur among sufficiently vulnerable, sufficiently vulnerable individuals when they experience a sufficiently stressful trigger. Everybody's triggers are different too. So that's going to be something that, you know, when you do your um, assessment, when you, when you do their, you know, their first session um, and you learn, learn about them, you learn what those triggers are. Those are all going to be different for each person. Um, so yeah, so A for A, uh, individuals with high baseline risk have low thresholds of activation and therefore experience frequent and long-lasting suicidal episodes even when experiencing mild stress. Individuals with low baseline risk have high thresholds of act for activation and therefore rarely experience suicidal episodes even when experiencing the same, uh, experiencing extreme stress. Okay. Number five, multiple suicide attempts and non-suicidal self-injury are the clearest markers of elevated baseline risk and vulnerability to persisting uh, per persisting risk. So they have a lot, a lot of history of multiple suicide attempts, self-injury, uh, definitely uh, going to affect on whether or not, you know, they're an A or B. Uh, let's see, acute suicide risk is resolves when the aggravating factors that maintain the suicidal mode are deactivated and reduced. All right. So the first phase of this treatment, it attacks the acute risk, makes, you know, helps them get back down to their baseline and then they help them with the baseline stuff, okay? After resolution of the acute suicidal episode, an individual returns to his or her baseline risk level. Okay, so that's the theory of suicide, okay? That is what, you know, the book is based off of, all the, all the interventions, how their, you know, their whole plan of attack is based on this model here. Oops. Okay, so let's get into uh, part one and all the different parts and kind of talk about the meat of the, the book here. Uh, all this stuff here we just went over is, is mainly in part one. You know, um, talks a big a big section about CBT. Um, it has the suicide risk assessments in there. Uh, it, it gives you a suicide risk assessment in the appendices uh, somewhere. Oh, here it is right here, as you can see. Um, so if you don't have one or if you want to know what one kind of looks like, you know, they give you access to uh, 
a, a risk assessment. Okay. And three things you want to look at when uh, assessing risk is foreseeability, suicidal desire, and resolve planning. Okay. Uh, the biggest one is resolve planning. Um, I believe that's the objective. Um, and the suicide desire is a subjective. It's kind of like, um, yeah, there's this client is talking about how they wanted to die, but they don't really talk about, oh, I, you know, I have all this other things going on in my life, you know, oh, my, you know, um, maybe poverty or I lost my job or, you know, or not, maybe not lose your job. That might be more. But it's, it's that objective stuff that the client's not really going to look at. That's something that you're going to have to find out. Um, it's much more uh, covert that resolve planning. Brief overview of the entire BCP, uh, BC, BT from beginning to end. So they give you a, a really, you know, a good layout, a good, um, um, what's it called, outline uh, of BC, BT from beginning to end in this part. Okay. Part two. Part two is the first session. The narrative assessment. So during the first session, it's kind of jam-packed. One thing I noticed, uh, uh, I mean, the narrative assessment, geez, that could be one session right there, but no, they want the, uh, the narrative assessment, which is the detailed description of the most recent attempt. Uh, they want the treatment log. A treatment log is a small handheld book, um, approximately three by four, but I mean, if you, uh, I think that's like a little spiral notebook. It's the, the little ones. Uh, and you give that to the patient so that he, he or she can take notes and keep track of lessons learned at the end of each session. This comes in, in handy, uh, I think, at, towards the end when they do the, uh, the last part. Um, so that's the treatment log, case conceptualization, and then the, uh, the crisis response plan. Uh, crisis response plans is a collaboratively developed written plan that the patient can follow during suicidal crisis or periods of emotional distress that precedes the onset of acute suicide crisis so remember the first session these people they're still in that acute they're still um in that in that suicidal mode um so you need to you know by the time of the the first session's over with you got to give them something to go home with you, you got to have a plan on what you're going to do if you feel like suicide if you feel like uh you want to end your life so this crisis response plan is something that you work on uh, they said it's a written plan and the patient i call them clients um they are the ones that write, that write it, not the therapist, um, the, 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 uh, the patient. Make sure the patient's writing. Um, let's see. Um, I want to see if they give you an exam. Do they give you a, a crisis response plan in, in this book here? Let me check here. The appendices, they give you almost everything you need um, as far as the different tools. Yeah, crisis response plan template. So they give you that in the back of the book if you don't have one. Um, but it's pretty, it's not, it's, it's just a small little plan. What is it? One, two, three, four. There's like five boxes there. I don't know if you can see it. Um, but again, it's just something, you know, for the client to take home and say, Hey, keep this on you, put it in your pocket, put it in your wallet, put it in your purse, whatever, wherever you got to have this on you all times in case you're feeling that way. You have something to, to use. Okay. So that's the first session, jam-packed session. That that's going to be a rush right there. I feel uh, I could probably spend an hour on on um, I know the narrative assessment, but also crisis response plan. That could be uh, pretty lengthy. So, but that's part two, first session. Part three, phase one, emotion regulation and crisis management. We are in the acute. These, this is what we're going to focus on. This is four sessions in duration, and we're focusing on acute. We're trying to get them back to that baseline. Treatment planning and the commitment of treatment statements. Uh, means safety counseling. Getting rid of any means that could be used for suicide. Firearms. Who's going to you know hold on to them? Where are you going to put them? Um, lock them up. Give somebody the key. Uh, what what are you doing to keep you know keep those means of suicide out of your out of your reach? Crisis support plan. Uh, targeting sleep disturbances. Relaxation, mindfulness skills training, and the reasons for living list. And the survival kit. They go through each one of these. I believe each one is a chapter, uh, and they give you everything you need. Okay, the treatment statement, mean safety counseling, crisis support plan. They give you all the stuff in the appendices. Uh, 
So that's very useful. It's very helpful. Um, I like that, that you know when a, when a, a workbook gives you that stuff. You know, if it's not something that you like, you know, it's something it gives you an example of what you can do or what you should, you know, kind of give you an idea of what you can use. Um, but you do this. Uh, this is going to be over four sessions. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five. So this, let's see. So one of the, I mean, <laughs> uh, one, two of these are going to have to be in one session. Um, so. But that is phase one. That is the acute. Phase two, undermining the suicidal belief system. This looks at the baseline, and this is five sessions, so a little bit longer, but we're dealing with baseline stuff. This is this is stuff that's uh, you know been around a long time. It's going to take a long time to to uh, fix because it's been ingrained in you know some of these things have been ingrained in your in your head for so long. You got ABC worksheets, challenging questions worksheets. Pattern of problematic thinking worksheets, activity planning, and coping cards. If you're not a fan of CBT, you're not going to like any of these interventions because this is all basic CBT stuff. Worksheets, 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 homework, homework, homework. Um, a lot of that in, 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 in this book. And all these are, again, in the appendices for you to use. Okay, next up, ABC worksheets. Okay, I want to give you an example of what a chapter looks like. So ABC worksheets, challenging questions, these are all uh, a different chapter, okay? And this is what each chapter looks like, give you an idea, okay? So ABC worksheets, it gives you the definition of what they are. It gives you the rationale for using them and, and how that fits into the fluid vulnerability model and how that works against, um, you know, their, their um, um, you know, their beliefs and their thoughts and their thinking. Uh, so it gives you the rationale. It tells you how to do it by giving you steps. They give you step one, step two, step three. Step one is usually like how to describe this to your client. Um, and it, it, it tells you how to do that. And it gives you an illustrative case example in each chapter. So it's basically um, a vignette about a, of a therapist talking to their client about it. It gives you some tips and advice on, on you know um, things that the authors, I think the authors probably ran into because a lot of these tips and advice seem real world stuff uh, and how they talk about that. Uh, and again, the ABC worksheets are found in the appendix. Okay, so it gives you everything. It, it tries to leave no st uh, stone unturned. Phase five, no, phase three, part five. This is the last part. Two sessions, the relapse prevention task, and ending treatment. You will be doing a lot of rehearsals, rehearsals, rehearsals. You want the client to adapt and change and be resilient. So you'll probably end up going over your, you know, the, the that um, that suicidal incident that got them into treatment. You'll go over that, but then you'll spin, you know, uh, change some things and spin it around and, and and really test that client on how they adapt and how what you know what they're gonna do, and kind of determine oh they you know what they can do it. And uh, I think when the therapist feels comfortable that hey yeah this client can take on any challenge or anything that comes their way, that's when they they end treatment. So a lot of rehearsals um, during the last phase. Overall, this is from the book. Uh, BCBT was specifically designed to reduce baseline risk for suicide attempts that can persist over a long time. Even when an individual is not in acute distress, BCBT accomplishes this goal by focusing on the acquisition of new skills and coping strategies that enable the patient to respond more effectively to life stressors and replacing the suicidal belief system with more positive and adaptive schemas that promote resiliency and decrease vulnerability to suicidal crisis. Now that is written by uh, Brian Rudd, but overall I love that paragraph. I think it, it really encapsulates uh, what BCBT is trying to do. And that is it, man. Overall, like honestly, in my opinion, this is a great book. I took a webinar and the guy doing the webinar, um, he used this book. And it just, it really clicked, you know, really interests me because I, I like CBT. That's what I, I go with. Um, <clears throat> I've never done a brief version of anything. Um, but I really like, um, I, I, you know, I like structure. I like phases. I like, um, I like treatment that way. It's just, it, 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 it attracts me. Um, I'm not a big talk therapy kind of guy, even though, um, 
it's useful. It does have its uses, and some clients prefer that, and that's fine with me. Uh, but I really liked it, and and, and uh, after the webinar, I went out and bought this book, and I read through it, and I loved it. I think it's great, and I think my camera just shifted. Hang on a second, guys. Uh, um, but I, I'd recommend it. if you're in a CBT, if you're if you're working in that population and looking for for uh, some some interventions. This is, this is a great resource. Uh, I'd recommend it if you're interested in CBT, if you're interested in psychoanalytic or um, something existential, you know, existential or something like that. I don't know if you'd like it as much. DBT, you'd probably like it. CBT, EC, um, is it ECT? Yeah, I can't remember. But yeah, um, it has a lot of work uh, worksheets, a lot of homework, uh, very phased, very structured. It's not, um, it, it's not. Uh, I don't want to say abstract, but it's, you know, there's, there's definitely uh, structured. So, if that's what you like, uh, I would pick it up. Uh, I, I would get this book. It's really, it's great. I like it. Uh, I'm, I'm actually looking at, at into the. Um, the, the training they offer, let me see, get out of this here, uh, on PASI, I was going to kind of sign up for this, this uh, Essential to Treating Preventing Suicide, it's by Craig J. Bryan, and they go into BCBT uh, much more in depth there, so just to get that extra training, um, but yeah, the suicide could be a scary thing, I think a lot, especially new therapists, you know, it's such a, it's such a, um, um, stressful thing because you know someone's life could be on the line here and you need to know what to do um and i know like you 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 go to masters and you go into you know your school programs and everything like that um but i don't i don't know of anyone who got got out of their master's degree and felt completely competent um in in, in dealing with suicide so um I, I, I never take an avoidance approach. Whenever I'm feeling nervous about something, I, I always I try to read as much as possible. I try to consult with my supervisor and learn as much as I can about how to treat that. Uh, suicide is something we should all have more training in. It's uh, probably one, I think, yeah, I think it's one of the things we probably need a lot more training in and much more focus on. Uh, the, the, the rates of suicide in this country are... are for, for being in this country, I'm, I'm in the USA, we shouldn't have as many suicides as we do. Uh, it, it's ridiculous. And uh, uh, I, I hope, uh, you know, therapists watching this, you know, maybe, uh, you know, take take action, learn this stuff, and uh, hopefully prevent suicides in the future. So, but anyway, that's all I got. I uh, appreciate you watching. Uh, please give me a like, subscribe, give me a comment. Let me know how I did uh, or if you have a, a resource or any comments on suicide. Uh, let me know. I'd love to hear from them. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, and you have a great night.